This video is brought to you by Captivating History. Ancient Greece was the birthplace of democracy and a hotbed of philosophy, literature, and science. It boasts the most significant architecture of the ancient world, and some of it still stands today. Ancient Greece was at its peak between 500 and 300 BCE, but by 146 BCE, Greece had fallen under the control of the Romans. So how did this great civilization become amalgamated into the Roman Empire? When we imagine ancient Greece, we may well picture a unified country. However, Greece was not unified until 337 BCE under Philip of Macedonia. This unity continued until the death of his son, Alexander the Great. In 500 BCE, Greece was made up of several independent cities, a few of which became the world's first democratic states. Macedonia lay northward, surrounded by the Illyrians, the Thracians, and the Persian Empire. The Greek city-states included Epirus, Athens, Thebes, Corinth, Argos, and Sparta. Gorton was located in the south on the Isle of Crete, and Western Greeks resided in southern Italy in city-states like Neapolis, Croton, and Syracuse. By 200 BCE, the Greek influence had spread throughout the Middle East, it had lost control in Italy to the Romans, but it expanded east by conquering the Persians and Egyptians, getting as far as South Asia. Before Macedonia asserted power over the Greek nations, Athens was the most influential city-state in ancient Greece. It was here that democracy was born. However, only free Athenian men had the honor of being allowed to vote. Athens was also prized for its educational institutions. When Philip of Macedonia wanted a tutor for his son, he sent for 37-year-old Athenian resident Aristotle, who had studied at Plato's Academy. So it seems the wisdom of Athens was prized even amongst its rivals. Under Alexander the Great, Greece rapidly grew in size. Alexander completed his father's mission of conquering the Persians and expanded upon this quest exponentially. However, his only legitimate heir had not been born yet at the time of his death in 323 BCE, causing some dispute over who should rule the vast empire in his stead. While Alexander had been out conquering worlds, life back in Greece had been relatively peaceful. Once Alexander died, the generals he had left in charge of various parts of his empire began to vie for power. Officially, Alexander IV received Alexander the Great's throne upon his birth with a general named Perdiccas acting as regent. But in actuality, Alexander's old comrades-in-arms began to secure control over various parts of the empire. In Greece and Macedonia, a senior general named Antipater was in charge. A year after Alexander died, the League of Corinth, which included Athens, Sparta, and Corinth, tried to overthrow Macedonian control. The rebellion was unsuccessful and resulted in Antipater forcing each city to sign separate treaties with Macedonia. Athens was compelled to give up their democracy, and any political decision-making was placed firmly in the hands of the wealthy. What followed was decades of infighting amongst various parts of Alexander's empire, with control of parts of Greece constantly changing hands and the Greek city-states powerless to stop it. In 310 BCE, Cassander, son of Antipater, had Alexander the Great's son and widow murdered in order to maintain his power. In Greece, many city-states began to band together to stave off the constant attacks from Alexander's successors. The first to form was the Aetolian League, which became a permanent military and political force around 290 BCE. The Achaean League had previously been a loose religious association, reformed in 280 BCE in the same vein as the Aetolians. While all of this internal turmoil was consuming the Grecian territories, a new power was rising. Since the 8th century, Italians, also called Romans, have been steadily gaining strength. The Romans were well aware of the Greeks and had encountered their culture in the Greek settlements of southern Italy. Despite their successes, the Romans were still relatively primitive compared to the enlightened Greeks, and the Romans coveted the Greek culture and lifestyle. In 280 BCE, the Greeks of southern Italy called in Pyrrhus, king of Epirus, to help them in their ongoing war with the Romans. The Pyrrhic War was extremely costly for the Greek king and resulted in all Italian territories submitting to Rome. This victory against the organized troops of Greece solidified Rome as a legitimate threat. Then, in 279, 
a large horde of Gauls invaded Macedonia before moving on to Greece. The Aetolians in Greece successfully repelled the attack, but Macedonia had not been so lucky. In 277, Antigonus II Gennadis, who ruled Greek city-states including Athens and Thebes, took his army up to Macedonia and defeated the Gauls. Antigonus founded a dynasty in Macedonia that lasted until the Roman conquest, but it was not without trials and tribulations. Shortly after the Gauls were expelled, Macedonia was invaded by a neighboring kingdom, Epirus. Epirus' king, Pyrrhus, had just been defeated by the Romans in southern Italy, but was able to occupy most of Macedonia, driving Antigonus into the coastal regions to the east. However, Pyrrhus moved on to invade Greece, leaving Antigonus to take back Macedonia and pursue him into Greece. Pyrrhus was killed in 272 at a battle in Argos, and Antigonus started expanding Macedonia into Greece. This expansion was met with fierce resistance from the Aetolian and Achaean leagues, who developed their influence and added more city-states to their numbers. It was not until Antigonus's son, Demetrius, ruled that Macedonia expanded successfully into areas of Greece. When Demetrius died in 229 BCE, his uncle, Docin, was left in charge as regent in the stead of Demetrius's nine-year-old son, Philip V. Back in Greece, Sparta was under the rule of King Cleomenes III. The Spartans had rebuilt their army and were expanding their territories. This was a cause of concern for the Achaean League, who called down their former enemies, the Macedonians, for help. Docin aligned with the Achaean League and several other Greek city-states to defeat the Spartan army. This further expanded Macedonian influence, which was challenged unsuccessfully by the Aetolians, as the combined forces of the Macedonians and the Achaeans met them. But the threat from Rome was growing, and in 215 BCE, while the Romans were preoccupied with the Second Punic War with Carthage, Philip V of Macedonia aligned with Hannibal of Carthage and began attacking Roman settlements in Illyria. After this first Macedonian war, Philip was able to keep his conquered territories in Illyria and set his sights on expanding into Greece. Some Greek city-states allied with Rome, and in 200 BCE, war with the Macedonians was once again declared. In 198 BCE, the Romans, led by Flamininus, arrived in Greece and gained the support of the Achaean League. After several skirmishes, the two forces met in battle on a hill range called Cenocephale. Ultimately, the Romans were victorious, but Flamininus still proposed generous terms to the defeated Macedonian king. Philip V was forced to give up all territories outside Macedonia, but he was allowed to keep his throne under the conditions of reducing his army and navy. Macedonia fought two more wars with the Romans. Philip's son Perseus was defeated in 168 BCE, after which the Romans attempted to control the region and prevent it from becoming powerful enough to defy them again. They were successful until a Greek named Andriscus, who bore a resemblance to Perseus and claimed to be his son, attempted to reinstate the Macedonian kingdom. After this final Macedonian defeat in 148 BCE, the Romans made Macedonia a Roman province, taking direct control. In the years that followed, the cities of the Achaean League attempted to rebel against their former Roman allies. After years of tense diplomacy, the Achaean War was fought in 146 BCE. Within the year, the Romans would be triumphant, signaling the beginning of the end for the ancient Greeks. By subjugating Macedonia, the Romans marched into Greece, defeating an Achaean army at the Battle of Scarphia. Several Greek cities immediately surrendered to the Romans to spare themselves further turmoil. After more Roman victories, the League gathered at their capital, Corinth, for a last stand. After an initial successful night raid by the Achaeans, the Romans were able to break the Achaean spirit and ranks the next day. The Achaean leader fled to Arcadia and killed himself, which further demoralized the Grecian troops, and they, along with many Corinthians, fled the city. The Romans, fearing an ambush, waited three days before entering the city. Once inside, they massacred any males and enslaved all the women and children before destroying the city, plundering its treasures. While the peoples of northern Greece became subjects of the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire became distinctly more Greek, with statues and artwork transported to Italy. With Macedonia and northern Greece firmly under Roman control, it was only a matter of time before the entirety of Greece became part of the Roman Empire. 
the Athenians tried to revolt in 88 BCE. The Romans had left Athens an independent state, although their presence in Greece undoubtedly affected the Athenians. After the sack of Corinth, the true nature of the Romans became apparent, and resentment towards Rome started to grow. The resentment intensified when Rome failed to intervene when the Athenian chief magistrate refused to abide by their one-term limit. These feelings of antipathy towards Rome led to an open rebellion, causing Rome to lay siege to Athens. Between 87 and 86 BCE, the Romans trapped the Athenians within the walls of Athens before they managed to break through Athenian defenses. Weak from hunger due to the long siege, Athens fell. Many citizens were killed, women and children included. Some Athenians were so distraught they threw themselves upon the weapons of the Romans. Thousands of years later, archaeologists uncovered caches of coins minted during the year of the siege that Athenian citizens had hidden from the Romans. Despite these tragic defeats, life for the Greeks was allowed to continue undisturbed, and they kept their language, culture, and way of life. The Greek culture made its mark upon the Romans, with the Romans adopting many social structures, architecture, military tactics, and even the gods of Greece. The Romans revered the Greek culture to such an extent that they rebuilt many parts of Greece that had been destroyed during the wars. Affluent Roman citizens and rulers often employed Greek tutors for their children, and the Romans even adopted Greek as their favorite language over Latin. A Roman poet called Horace mused that captive Greece captured her rude conqueror. After the fragmentation of the Roman Empire, Greece offered strength and stability to the Byzantine Empire, also called the Eastern Roman Empire. Even though ancient Greece came under Roman control, Greece never did truly fall. After it was conquered, the Romans took the Grecian culture all over the known world and even produced a Greco-Roman culture based on the combination of these two powerful influencers. Ancient Greece was never really one unified country, perhaps due to its mountainous mainland, but it managed to have such a strong influence that it changed the language, gods, arts, and architecture of one of history's greatest empires. To learn more about ancient Greece, check out our book, Ancient Greece, a captivating guide to Greek history starting from the Greek Dark Ages to the end of antiquity. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. Also, grab your free mythology bundle ebook while it's still available. All links are in the description. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.